This is Speak of the Devils on AZ Family Sports. Welcome to Speak of the Devils, the premier TV show for Sun Devil football. I'm Brad Denny with 3TV. And I'm Joe Healy with DevilsDigest.com. Joe, ASU season is finally over. Unfortunately, the Territorial Cup still resides in Tucson. But even though it's the offseason, there is certainly no shortage of things going on. This weird, wild existence of college sports and specifically college football, it's so strange that when the regular season dies down, we're used to that being a dormant time where you really miss football and you're counting the months till next year but nowadays it's like the activity and action really spikes especially when you're positioned like asu where there is no postseason so the the chaos of the transfer portal which as we'll talk about is has been a little chaotic but not necessarily as much as it could be though there's a lot of time left to fill uh there's a lot going on and a lot for us to talk about yeah so there's some changes on asu's coaching staff as you mentioned some portal entries uh, the window is now open uh, a lot going on. This is typically the you know the time of year where we hand out some season awards, and we will hand out a couple at the end of this show. But uh, you know, let's just dive right into some of the big changes. A couple of the coaching staff changes uh, has been made. Two, to be exact, one that we kind of that we knew was coming with offensive coordinator Bo Baldwin, who had his play calling duties stripped from him uh, in after week three uh, with Kenny Dillingham taking those over. That we knew ASU was going to get a new offensive coordinator, and they kind of made a splash hire, a known name, Marcus Arroyo who made his uh, kind of came, rose to prominence from 2017 to 2019 as Oregon's offensive coordinator, kind of the guy shepherding Justin Herbert's development into a top NFL prospect and now top NFL quarterback. Uh, so, of course, he went on from there to co- uh, be the head coach at UNLV, a program that has historically had a lot of problems, but gradually built them into and kind of laid a foundation for their success this year. So I think overall, pretty good hire. Yeah, I think it really checks a lot of very important boxes. Like you talked about, he's got a lot of credibility from his time at, at Oregon and at UNLV. And I, and I honestly don't care what happened with him as a head coach. When you're bringing him in as an offensive coordinator, that's a big deal. And of course, a quarterback coach. So not only is he uh, you know, a specialist in coordinating the offense, but working specifically with quarterbacks. And that's what you need uh, when you're in the position that ASU is in. So he brings a lot of energy, some youth to it. I, I, you know, it was a weird little nugget that I kind of remember the name. He played against ASU in 2001 when he was <laughs> playing for San Jose State. Uh, he's obviously got a lot of West Coast ties, and that's something that a lot of folks have been clamoring for when it comes to recruiting because you've got the emphasis on the state of Arizona. You've got the emphasis on the state of Texas. But a lot of folks, even though ASU, of course, is shifting out of the Pac-12 conference, you want to get those players from California and other areas of the West Coast, and he brings that as well. So I think it's a quite a very good hire it's got a, a lot of uh, you know accolades online people are pretty happy about it on a national scale so i think that's a, a very very solid hire yeah so we'll see exactly how he uh, gets that relationship going with kenny dillingham and the offense uh, you know a lot of room for improvement from this past season now switching over to the defense there was a change at the defensive line coach vince amy who took the job this uh, past season a former member of asu's rose bowl team back in the 90s uh, he's going to stay on the staff but move to an analyst role as Dyron Reynolds comes over from Michigan State had several years prior to that coaching the D-line at Stanford a couple of uh, five draft picks developed under his resume a couple of All-Americans as well uh, so he'll be manning the Sun Devil defensive line for 2024. Yeah, he was at Stanford for several years, and and what we remember about Stanford, obviously they had a lot of good teams back then. The line play was incredible, and the, and the defensive line specifically, he guided some some high caliber college and pro players. So the resume very very strong, very impressive, and he like Arroyo, of course, he has a West Coast background. So these are probably moves that are happening for a reason, so that ASU can branch out more into per, perhaps into California for its recruiting. Um, and you know, as far as the move with Vince Amy, you, you you can't help but love the guy. I mean his personality is so endearing he's an awesome awesome human being as you mentioned he's a sun devil alum a starting defensive lineman on the 1997 rose bowl team from that 96 pac 10 championship squad um so it's great for him to remain around the program still involved you know a lot of folks were really fired up when he became a member of this coaching staff and kenny dillingham was hired last year so you kind of get the best of both worlds where he remains on staff and you get in reynolds who has uh, you know quite a pedigree when it comes to uh, recruiting and building up defensive linemen all right, let's turn our attention now to the transfer portal. The window, uh, the 30-day window for this, uh, the fall uh, window has opened up on uh, October, Monday, October 4th. It's going to open for 30 days. So ASU has already had a couple guys that have made their attentions clear during the season, but six guys so far as of this recording have jumped in. Now quarterback Drew Pine, running back Javen Jacobs, and linebacker James DeJoncom, depth guys, 
people that uh, were kind of, you know, aren't going to take a major hit onto the 2024 roster. Now, there's three guys that uh, have raised, uh, you know, some more notable, prominent names, starting with tight end Jalen Conyers. Yeah, that was one that a lot of folks were speculating about, so it's not a, a massive surprise when you have all the factors coming into play where he's a high-profile player, someone that does have NFL potential. Obviously, this season statistically for him was not what anybody expected. When you factor in the whole NIL thing, it, it is something that, that does make sense. He hasn't made a decision quite yet on his destination, uh, but will remain to, to be seen if uh, ASU remains a factor for him, if the possibility of returning is there. And one guy who has made his decision as to his next stop is defensive back Jordan Clark, son of former Steeler Ryan Clark. Uh, he is committed to Notre Dame, so that's a big loss for ASU's defense, uh, both for his on-field play, but probably even more so for his leadership. Yeah, I mean, he, he's one of the all-timers, if you ask me, as far as his, you know, his personality, his disposition, the leadership that he brought to this team. He's one of those players that, uh, that ASU fans should still remember fondly, even though he's finishing his career elsewhere. And, you know, we saw today here about how uh, Kenny Dillingham said some very positive things about him and his father, Ryan Clark. So, you know, it's just a really uh, a positive separation. So all the best to him at Notre Dame. And then another hit on the defense, defensive end, B.J. Green, uh, all Pac-12 second team selection, jumping in the portal. Yeah, that's another one where we'll see what happens there. But he's someone that uh, was named a second team all Pac-12. So he's someone that, uh, whether it's back at ASU or elsewhere, has a tremendous amount of talent to finish off his career, came from a walk-on to an all-conference player. So a, a very significant loss if he happens to not come back to ASU. Of course, guys, yeah, can they can enter the portal? They can also jump back out as Green did a season ago. But we've got a lot to talk about. We'll be breaking this much down, much uh, in greater detail on our full podcast episode. Uh, but up, coming up next over the next two segments, going to bring you some uh, snippets of some sit-down series episodes. First up, you'll hear from former ASU offensive lineman Joey Ramos, and then you'll hear from ASU women's head basketball coach Natasha Adair about that her team's hot start to the season. 11 different starting offensive line combinations over 12 games. Is, it's pretty wild. I've covered this team since 2011. I've never seen anything kind of like this. What, you know, For a unit like the offensive line, which really kind of thrives so much on chemistry and, and kind of the unit gelling together, not having that that uh, that uh, you know, consistency there, what kind of impact did that have on you guys? Um, I don't think it, it bothered us too much. You know, um, In the spring, Coach Saga made sure that we were bouncing around with different mix-ups. So, I mean – me playing next to Max wasn't a surprise for me. I played next to him basically most of the spring. Uh, playing next to Emmett, that was all fall camp. Playing next to Sean. Sean's a young dude, but he was, I mean, I every time he was next to me, I was like, dude, calm down. Do your job and just have fun, dude. Like, you're young. You're a freshman playing Power 5 football, dog. Like, enjoy this, man. Not a lot of dudes can do this. Um, Cade, I mean, all those dudes. Every dude that I played next to, Leaf, whether it's sometimes even Glass, who, who knows, Sione, Frost. All these different dudes that I played next to, you know, I mean, we had this chemistry in the room. It didn't have to be starting five, but we call ourselves the one SB. It's a one snap brotherhood. That's kind of our mantra of that offensive line. And it was every set, every snap, we signed a one snap contract to each other that we're going to give mm. our maximum effort to each other. We're going to give it all for one play. And then we're going to come back to the huddle. We're going to come back to the line. And we're going to do it again every single play. So, I mean, we had great chemistry in that room. Everyone loved each other. So, I mean, the different combinations, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to get comfortable with. But, I mean, we, that just shows the ability that those guys had to, whether it was someone completely random or someone you've been playing next to all season, they're going to get the job done regardless. Now, obviously, you guys did a great job handling that adversity and kind of rolling with, with uh, what each week would kind of bring you in terms of the availability of personnel and, and so on. But was there ever just a sense of just like, <clears throat> oh, what now? I mean, because obviously, you know, so many guys had various injuries and the position just seemed to be so acutely hit by the injury bug. Was there ever just kind of a sense of frustration? You know, even knowing that, you know, you guys, of course, have that, that one snap brotherhood, but just, you know, just kind of like, oh, man, like, really? Yeah. I mean, there was a couple times where we were just like, well, we got with what we got, man. We got to roll with who we got. We have six dudes that are healthy. Screw it. There's going to be six dudes that we're going to be rolling with. Um, we'd always make jokes like, all right, Leaf, be ready to go out to tackle this week. We lost our third <laughs> tackle this year. Or just jokes like that. And But even if he had to do it, he'd be willing to go out there and he'd give it his all and he would try to be the best version of himself. I mean, you saw Cade do it. He hadn't played tackle since his first two years of football. Decided to go out left tackle versus arguably the best defensive end we faced lot to and he he played his game i mean it's it's props to him man that's not hard that's <laughs> not easy to do sean did it against utah and i mean all of our dudes were battling with regardless who we had the one that maybe made you shake your head a little bit 
Um, probably when we were like we're kind of out of quarterbacks. I was <laughs> that was the moment I was just like, damn, like, <laughs> like I was just kind of I had took a step back and I was just taken by surprise. I was just that's that's the first time that's ever happened. I've never ran out of quarterbacks to where we have to put Scad or Jalen back there and. And props to them. I mean, I know that's not their position, and I know they were doing anything they could to help the team. So I really appreciate them for that. But I mean, it's unfair to them. It's it's more on us because we got to we had to do a better job of keeping our quarterbacks healthy or whatever the situation was. Um, but you know, hats off to those guys. I mean, playing a position that they didn't come to college for takes a lot of skill. So shout out to those guys. But that when running out of quarterbacks was definitely one of the weirdest moments for me this year. And of course, you know, you know, Trenton's out there, kind of banged up a little bit, and you know that UCLA game was just kind of so interesting to me when uh, Kenny was talking to us about how Marvin Lewis came to him with the idea of you know throwing it back to the, the '70s, and they're looking up on uh, you know kind of the the offense on YouTube on on Tuesday. You guys go out there in the Rose Bowl on Saturday, just a few days later, get the big W. What was that like from a lineman's perspective? Just a you know swinging gate is kind of I believe you guys use it like almost nearly thirty times yeah. in that game. What, what was that that kind of process like of basically installing the, the offense uh, just a couple days beforehand from YouTube and, and getting out there and executing it to a win. So when Coach Dilly mentioned it to us, we were like, all right, like whatever needs to be done to, to win this game, you know, we all we need to get another win and we were all hungry for it. So I think the funniest was definitely when we were running it against UCLA, just watching their defense get extremely irritated with us, calling <laughs> us names. And we were, I mean, the dudes that were going out, except for Leaf, he was not having a fun time because he was basically playing advanced seven on seven for the first half. It was just him versus the whole defense. Um, but it was definitely fun kind of taunting the defense. Like, all right, guys, let's go jog over here. Let's go jog <laughs> over there. We're not doing anything and neither are you. Um, messing with them mentally. I think that definitely helped us in the game too. You know, it kind of took them by surprise that they're like, what, what's going on? Like, there's so much more to think about. So I definitely think that that confused them. But, you know, Coach Dilly installed it, and we do what we're told, you know. I mean, if he wants a certain play where all of us spread out 10, 15 yards apart, we'll do it like that. <laughs> but that was definitely a fun game, you know. Getting to getting those, getting under those guys' skin was really easy to do too. So, I mean, that was definitely interesting, but it was a, it was a fun time. Glad I it was my first time in the Rose Bowl and walked away with the win. So I'm happy with it. What do you see as the potential? of Sun Devil football in the next couple of years under Coach Dillingham? I think the sky's the limit. You know, I think if he can get some dudes that – if he can get some really good dudes that can really buy into his process and just lead – have a player-led team, man, I think the sky's the limit for this team, man. I mean, the crazy thing about college football is that anything could happen. There's always a team that underestimates someone, and why not us, you know? I think that should be their motto is why not us. You know, people are counting them out already with some big transfers leaving, but – who cares? I mean, players play. Players are going to make plays, and the coaches are going to continue to coach and develop these players to be great. So I think if the team can stay together and we can get some some key components, I think the sky's the limits for this team. You know, anything can happen in the Big Twelve. Anything can happen in Tempe. Five, ten years down the road, you know, when the name Joey Ramos is uttered in ASU circles, how do you hope the Sun Devil fans remember you? A dude that gave it all. You know, a dude that lived with zero regrets and a dude that embraced, like I said, the ugly, the the dude that did the things that nobody wanted to do. And, you know, just a great leader and, and, and a mentor to young dudes and someone that someone can look up to. So that's I kind of wanted to leave my legacy as someone that can always be counted on a dude that did the ugly and the dude that gave it his all regardless of his situations. All right, coach, nine games into the season, nice seven and two mark so far. Kind of in a, in a broad sense, what are some of the, the things you've learned about your team over these first nine games? Well, I'll tell you that our team is resilient. Um, I think that uh, every contest so far, we're, we're just building that, that culture, that chemistry, that camaraderie. Uh, it's a brand new team, you know, from a year ago, eight new players. And so that culture building is not going to happen overnight. But what I have learned and I'm watching each one of them grow. They're taking on new roles. I think they're players that are stepping up. But every night, it, it seems like it's a new player emerging. <laughs> so for me as a coach, you, you you look at that and say, wow, okay, it's starting to make sense. The light bulb is on. They're, they're finding their mojo. They're, they're getting more confident as individuals and then collectively as a team. And so uh, if, if you want to talk about how we're trending, 
we're trending in the right direction as we're preparing, obviously, for Pac-12 play. Now, as you mentioned, you know, so many new pieces, just kind of, you know, maybe that's just the, the nature of every team in the in the portal era. About how long do you think it takes to, you know, finally as a coach to, you know, get an accurate read on your team? You know, you, you mentioned just kind of every night it might be a new player doing something. How long does it take, you know, in the process, especially these days, to kind of get a true feel for what your squad has? Well, I think you do a really good job, and I know we have. Um, just when they get in, it's all about culture building, culture building. And you use the – the off season to really learn for me as a coach, learn about each individual player, learn their passions, what motivates them. But I think, you know, it, the non-conference is there for a reason. You know, it takes those, you know, 11 to, to 12 games to really figure out, all right, what's my best defensive lineup? What's my best offensive lineup? If I need to, if I need a three at the end of the game, who's going to knock down that shot? Because you learn that through playing. You learn that over time. So, uh, again, having that non-conference slate really does prepare you for conference play because you learn about your team, but they also learn about themselves and each other. Uh, and, and so I think it does take, you know, what is that, those two months um, before conference play starts to really learn your team and, and for them to learn one another. So when you kind of look over, you know, obviously those two big games coming up, but then the rest of the season, obviously, you know, getting as many W's as possible is the, the end goal. But right. what are the other key markers of success that you think that, you know, over this 2023, 20, 2024 campaign mm -hmm. that, you know, when the season wraps up, you can look back and be like, okay, we checked all these off. Right. This made it a successful season. Well, I think the biggest thing is, did we improve? You know, did we improve holistically? Um, and, and we have to be able to evaluate that. You know, were we competitive in, ev in every contest? Do I feel like our field goal percentage was where it needed to be? You know, I want us to be a team that, that consistently rebounds, total 40-plus rebounds a game, plus 20 offensive rebounds a game. So there are markers. Are we 80% from the free throw line? Those are team evaluations. Uh, did we have a positive assist to turnover ratio? Did we have players represented, um, you know, in the off-conference standings and things of that nature? But the biggest thing, the evaluation is, did we improve as a team? Did our players get better individually? Um, and, and that's a measure, you know, for me as a head coach, obviously for our assistant coaches who pour so much into our student athletes and for themselves. The biggest thing as a coach, you know, when those players have aha moments or the tireless hours in the gym, when they're working on that one pet move or that combo move, and you see them have those aha moments in game, that's the evaluation of did we get better? Obviously, it's, it's rack as many wins as you can, but if we're taking care of the things that we need to do from a team perspective, then those wins will happen. So I think it's just constantly teaching. Right. We're teaching every day. We're we're reevaluating. We're readjusting. We're making sure our players not just do it because we're telling them to do it, that they understand. Like this is another class for us. Basketball is 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 a, the gym is the classroom. And so we really want our players to know why they're doing what they're doing, have confidence in what they're doing. So I want you to see all that when you see them confident leaders, um, great communication out there, a, a culture that's um, just a very strong culture and 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 then you'll see the rest of it come come to fruition so I, I just think it's all encompassing and um, but the biggest word is just improvement in in every area and a team that competes with, with you I want you to leave our game obviously with the win but either way you can say wow they left it all on the floor they finished on empty this team truly competes all right, welcome back to Speak of the Devils. Now, this time of year, we always hand out our annual season awards. We highlight the best, the worst, and some of the weirdest and uh, more uh, off-the-wall topics that was the season uh, for the Sun Devils. So we're going to have a little selection, and you can catch the full slate on our full podcast episode. But, Joe, let's start things off with the best surprise of the year. There's a lot of things that were surprised about the year. What was the favorite for you? Mine's kind of like on the touchy feely side of things, and we've talked about this several times. Uh, the the best surprise for me was the buy in and the resilience of this team. So it's not necessarily one player's performance or a certain effort or things like that. It's the fact that ASU, uh, even though sometimes the scoreboard didn't reflect it, uh, stayed bought in. You saw it in the UCLA game. You saw players that were playing hard, playing tough all the way through. It's, I know it's a moral victory thing, and nobody really loves that, but that was a pleasant surprise that this team didn't pack it in. Yeah, the, the buy in and the fight was something certainly of note. 
For me, it was that the pass rush was actually good. <laughs> in the spring and fall, it was outstanding in practice, but ASU had so many offensive line questions. Wasn't exactly sure when it, the game started to count if that success and that uh, effectiveness would carry over. And for the most part, it did for the, the bulk of the season. B.J. Green, Prince Dorba, Clayton Smith especially, had some outstanding years. Now, this, of course, Joe, was a weird, weird season, unlike any other we've probably ever covered. What was your weirdest moment of the year? It was kind of an omen. Week one, it was a weird moment for me, for everybody. I remember I was in Mountain America Stadium at halftime of that Southern Utah game, and I looked, uh, what would it be, south. You see this haboob coming in. <laughs> so that couple-hour delay, week one, that was just one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced, uh, you know, just as a sports fan in general. It was a weird season, a lot of possibilities here. For me, that takes the cake because it was just so strange to start the year off that way. Yeah, that three, during that three-hour delay, the, the folks here at uh, 3 TV and CBS Live had me doing weather reports with Julia Lopez. Uh, didn't think I'd be doing that uh, when I woke up that morning. My weirdest moment was on the field against UCLA when in that uh, fourth quarter, ASU took a, a penalty before a punt and took another penalty and another penalty. Uh, and people were like, what the heck is going on? But uh, kind of the shrewd fox that Kenny Dillingham was, he saw that he was able to run about two, two and a half minutes off the clock of uh, when his team was holding a lead. Uh, and so that was good. At the time, although UCLA did score, it was just really weird, and I, th I thought it was nice to see Kenny just kind of getting the uh, weird edges of the rule book. Joe, who was your breakout player of the year? There are a few answers. Even though it's a team that only won three games, I think there are quite a few guys that you could uh, put in this role. I went with defensive back Shamari Simmons, and he's someone that, especially over like the back half of the season, really, really came on, ended up leading the team in tackles with 73, six-packs breakups, two fumble recoveries, an interception. So he started becoming kind of a tackling machine. He had a nose for the ball. He's someone that came up from the FCS level, and there's some like maybe Cam Scadaboo were somewhat known commodities from that level. He was someone that was a starter and a contributor and a high-level player but just coming up from that level didn't know a lot about him and he became one of the best if not the best defensive players on the entire roster this season my breakout player is also the defensive side of the ball another transfer guy came over from texas he was a four-star high school recruit but really wasn't able to find his stride with the longhorns found it with the sun devil defense defensive end prince dorba uh, unfortunately suffered an elbow injury that knocked him out for most of the, the end of the season but still had put up a great season six sacks really kind of flashed some potential of bj green in fact does leave through the portal dorba is going to be counted on even more and i think what we saw in 2023 asu fans should be feeling some pretty uh, good some some good confidence there finally joe Sun Devil MVP for 2023. I mean, you got to go with a guy that did it all, Cam Scadaboo. I mean, we're not just talking about running <laughs> and catching the ball. We're talking throwing the ball. We're talking punting. The guy did more things than I think any Sun Devil's done in a single season. Kept it going at a high level, even though there were, you know, physical limitations, injury issues, the season not being, uh, you know, what many expected. Always kept his heart going in the right direction. So he did it all, and that's a valuable thing in itself. So he gets MVP. Yeah, I believe he has a, a lion tattooed on his arm. I mean, just the, the lion-hearted nature that he played out there, the ferocity he played with the two – literally everything on the field you know, when this season began. Did not think he'd be playing quarterback, but uh, this guy right here is, uh, is certainly the MVP in terms of what he's able to do as a receiver, a runner, passer, punter. Uh, this guy did it all. So well, you can catch our full slate of season awards. We have many more that we break down on our full podcast episode available everywhere you get your podcast, as well as the full sit-down series episodes with Joey Ramos and Natasha A. Dare. Uh, Joe and I will be back next week. We'll have some special guests in studio as we take a comprehensive macro view of the season that was for the Sun Devils and try to digest what exactly it means for the short term and the middle term future for the Sun Devils.